Welcome back to the Film of Science, the double feature podcast. Join us as we unravel the interwoven experience of the continuous conversation of cinema. Take part in pairing movies with their cursed counterparts, movies that share DNA, or even pairing questionable duos by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash filmasteins. We offer tiers at the $1, $5, and $20 level, where the $5 tier grant the ability to request films to further the discussion. So grab some popcorn, sit back, and get ready to join the 100-year conversation. This is the Film of Steins, where movies are more than just entertainment, they're an experience. And welcome back to another episode of The Film of Steins. Thank you guys for joining us today. Today I am joined by my voyeuristic friend, Lucy. Hello, everyone. Remember, we post every Monday and Friday on free feeds and every other Wednesday on patreon.com slash film for exclusive episodes. Some recent episodes include Karate Kid, Your Name, Akira, Inside Out 2, Greta Gerwig's Lady Bird, and I Saw the TV Glow. Remember to leave nice comments, thoughts, and ideas on our Patreon as well. Come subscribe for a dollar. Come request a movie. Any movie will do. Not your Libre. Go rate us on Apple Podcasts. We appreciate all the support. Thank you guys very much. Are you stressed and filled with anxiety like I am? Maybe in a bit of pain from that car accident you had a few years ago? Well, the sponsor of today's episode, Hempville CBD, has us covered. They have the highest quality products created by chemists and doctors. Hempville carries everything from CBD to THC dispensary grade without those despicable dispensary prices. Order your Delta 8, 9, edibles, and vapes along with the THCA flower and get free shipping when you spend $50 or more at HempvilleCBD.com. Check out the link in the description for more details. But today we will be discussing the new Shyamalan movie, Ishana Night Shyamalan's 2024 film, The Watchers. Are we calling her I Night Shyamalan? I like that. I like that. This is our first of two Shyamalan movies this year. Very exciting. I think the other one's called Trap. We'll see how that goes. I'll be the first champion in the line defense of the Shyamalans. But I will say I didn't love The Watchers. It was fun. It's a little under appreciated we need to lighten up and have a little more fun with some films i might say the same thing to myself at times but the watchers is it's a movie i didn't expect the fairy thing just gonna go ahead and say that i did really enjoy this contextual backbone of the fairies watching the humans especially as some of our humans are watching our parody reality tv show love reality tv show Perhaps an overt commentary on the general public's emulation, replication of the things we idolize on some level, and just the things we really surround ourselves by. We saw something similar, and I saw the TV glow to an extreme case. But here in The Watchers, it's a little bit more of a parallel to kind of justify The Watchers' activity, which is obviously bizarre, right? And that observation seemed to be mostly meaningless as far as trying to say something. It was solely to build this parallel. But at the end of the day, we have this sort of, I don't know, maybe early 2000s feeling kind of film. Not a lot of personality per character. Not a lot of character. But sort of a soft horror take on trying to get out of a dangerous situation, right? With a Shyamalan twist. Not sure... If I love the twist, I don't, but I am very curious because you probably are the biggest Shyamalan fan I know of. How do you feel about The Watchers, Ishana Night Shyamalan's first film? I liked this movie. It was good. It was creepy and it was pretty good for her debut film. I'm not sure what people's problem is, but I thought it was a decent movie. I did enjoy the plot twist, although it wasn't the Shyamalan type of plot twist. His plot twists tend to have more like a gasp, but this plot twist was maybe a bit more obvious, although people claim his plot twists are super obvious. I don't know about that. I thought people claimed that his twists kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah, but everyone claims they knew exactly what was going to happen. So (laughs) Can't have it both ways, people. Yeah, exactly. So it didn't have that charm from a Shyamalan twist, but that's okay because this is not M. Night. This is his daughter. 
I'm glad they're different because that's very much his his signature. It's his flair. Yeah, this movie felt like it had a little bit too much. Not sure if it's too many questions or too many symbols, but I'm not sure if I'm supposed to read into it too much or not, or if it's just supposed to be very simple. I did enjoy the limited characters. We weren't given many characters. We were given like, what, five? Especially if you count Dakota Fanning as one character because she played her and her sister. But I really like them and I really like the bird. I'm sure we'll talk more about it here in a second, what the purpose of the bird is, but I liked him. I very much enjoyed him throughout the movie. I did like the horror elements of the film. You told me it wasn't a horror movie going into it, but you clearly lied. I mean, this didn't make me cover my eyes or anything, but it was definitely creepy. The score was great and the sound design was pretty good. I loved the pacing of the movie. It felt very straight to the point. We immediately went into action. But at the end of the day, I think the movie felt not super committed to one idea, but several ideas and wanted to explore several ideas. I think I tend to mostly agree. I'm kind of anxious to talk about the sticking point with a fairy escaping. It obviously highlights this point of emulation and trying to fit in, which contextually and symbolically are no doubt supported through the fairies observing and emulating the people in the coop, the bird emulating Dakota Fanning, the replication through reproducing humans and fairies, and then of course, you know, our fairy finally escaping. We see this through line very explicitly, and of course, the people in the coop watching Love Island or whatever. And it's obviously the major theme in the film, but why does it matter? Tell me. Why do we stick with the fairy escapes and can live amongst the humans? Which I'm fine with that literal point. I don't like how we got to that point with the fairy pretending to be Kara and tricking Dakota Fanning and that whole incident was just like oh no this is actually pretty bad but that's okay because you cannot like an ending and still like a film because part of me wants to say is just for fun this is just a fun movie but it's a little over the top in its emulation observing kind of parallels yeah I have a couple of things to say to that the first one to answer your point about what's the point of the halfling or whatever it's called at the end escaping that's a good question i also was a bit confused by it confused on what what the point of that thing being out in the open did it have something to say about us humans and always wanting to reproduce and survive and the only reason i make that stretched of a thought is because we name the bird Darwin. And of course, the infamous, or I guess not infamous, depends on who you are, I guess, but the famous Darwin everyone knows is Charles Darwin. And it kind of made me think of this just survival nature that not only us humans have, but these fairies have, and why not combine them and let them out into the world? I don't know if that's too stretched, but I like that in my mind. But no, because we see another parallel to Charles Darwin with the professor studying these creatures. Yeah. And it's over the top with the bird because Darwin studied finches. So, yeah. And I'm not going to lie. At first, I thought that the professor had mated with the one he caught. But no, I think he managed to catch the one he caught because it was a halfling, correct? It's not super clear. Oh, okay. Some people online seem to think That he did mate with it. Because at one point he said this one was different. Yeah, so I feel like that's enough evidence that, yeah, okay, this is the same one that's different. And it's replicating his, like, wife or whatever, girlfriend. His wife, yeah. So I'm not sure how people would get that. Just the vibe it gave. Just the, I don't know, maybe I didn't connect my dots until later on. But just watching it. 
that's where my thought process went because of all his research and all the stuff that Mina found at his office. Maybe it's intentional. He was obsessed. Yeah, maybe that's an intentional ambiguity then. But it does seem out of place because earlier I said this movie wasn't committed to one idea and I feel like this movie is trying to say something about Mina's grieving because very obvious through the movie she's she's messed up something's wrong with her she's still grieving the loss of her mom which again that was maybe like a little plot point that I didn't quite understand until the very end when it was explained but I thought her mom had recently passed and then you find out it happened when they were little girls so she is very very much still caught up in it years later but the movie didn't feel like psychological horror. It didn't feel like the Baba Duke, where the mom is very obviously grieving the loss of her husband and having a child and now is a single mother. Because like you said, we also have this idea of the watching and them watching while they're being watched, while we're watching them. I mean, it's just very over the top. And to what point? Is it saying something about how people behave when they know they're being watched? And that's as far as my idea went. <laughs> See, we have the bones here of something really special, maybe. Maybe the book's very good, the 2022 book. But there doesn't seem to be enough offered here to kind of ask any follow-up questions to these questions. Because there's no dialogue in this movie of any consequence it could have been a completely silent film and you got everything out of it there was nothing additive to the metaphor and symbolism it seemed to keep asking the same question but i will say i'm not confused enough that this film has turned me off but it's funny that we get this constant repetition of it because you mentioning us watching the film we had those two characters watching the watchers watch the people in the coop at one point, and it's just all over the place with its storytelling, maybe, but especially its commitment to the watching part. Because I thought we got this really powerful moment when the two were in like shrubbed pile of sticks shelter thing. They were watching the watchers, and the watchers are coming up, or the fairies are coming up to. I guess they're halflings, right? We're coming up to the coop all mangled and weird and creepy. They're really cool looking and we didn't get to see, you know, them very clearly. It was very cool. Yes, it's always nice. With the light behind them, the coop behind them, and we see just black figures, black slender men like tall figures. And when they got close enough to the coop, they stood up like human beings. They walked upright, they held hands. It was very cool. It just didn't go anywhere it screams that message of mimicking behaviors but i'm not sure how far it's trying to say that we mimic the things that we see in reality tv or royalty or whatever or is it as fundamental as children looking at their parents and mimicking their behavior kind of thing understanding this slightly higher species than you as far as intellectual know-how yeah, I'm not sure because I feel like all this watching had more of a negative connotation than watching for learning's sake. It was more, like you called me earlier, voyeuristic and more of a surveillance because no one that was watching was really authentic. Yeah, the two in the coop were who were watching the TV at one point. They were just bored. They were watching because it was just there. But I will say, I mean, at least we get it from Madeline. I think that was her name. She's kind of a narc. So <laughs> it's maybe not all that authentic at the end of the day. But she spoke of the watchers in such a romantic way that they just want to observe us. You just got to stand there. They don't. You don't need to act natural. She did say that, I guess, at some point, but. I think she meant it in the sense that to just calm the people, you know, when you got a camera on, you say, oh, does that act natural kind of thing. But no one acts natural. Exactly. that You're just saying that to kind of calm them. I don't really yeah. know why people actually say that. I don't know if that has actually any effect, but that is something that's just said like as a reflex almost. 
But I mean, I agree. There's no academic reasoning to be here to why anyone's looking at each other. Even when the professor's on the screen, we don't get a lot out of him because it's just this build up to him killing himself or getting killed by the watcher. So it's just this kind of horror device to make us afraid of being inside the coop all of a sudden. So it's just like, ah, it's fun. I'm still here for this, but man, I do wish there was more, of course. Because one of the other things that gets me, and I'm very curious to see how you feel about this, is these rules that Madeline shared. Now that we know she's not a real human, now all of a sudden we're suspicious of these rules. Because some of the rules were never turn your back on them, never go near the burrows, always, you know, be inside the coop at dark time or whatever, however they phrase that. But I didn't feel like there was... There was no consequence to yeah. breaking the rules. I saw their backs turned many times. Yeah. She went into the burrows. I guess that's when supposedly shit went crazy. But now, how do we know Madeline didn't cause that? It didn't feel like a problem. It didn't really feel like the rules were rules and they were just more advice to try to stay alive so you can later help me get out of here. And I guess that's what they ended up being. They ended up just being these kind of convenient things that Madeline was able to pull out at here and there. But as far as cinematic storytelling, it's brought up enough that there needs to be something a little more substantial around these rules. Because I think she establishes a couple of them and then brings up one or two more later at her convenience. That can be fine, but the rules matter so little already that why well, I don't really care. Like The rules really are irrelevant. Yeah, and part of me wonders if the only reason for the rules was so we can know that Mina is a rule breaker. Mm, that's, I mean, that's exactly right. You're, uh, uh, she was in the back seat. Yeah. She's fucking she getting crazy back there. Her mom was like, "Settle down." She killed her mom. You're right. That's that's all that really is. It's simple, kind of elementary character building, wasn't it? Yeah, I, that's. That's what I'm assuming, but like you said, they said it a little too many times for that to have been the only point. But the flashback only kind of embraced that. She's like, oh. She obviously don't listen. It might be a case of bad storytelling. I hate to say it. Because I was trying to think of another movie where we have these rules that are presented to us, whether we must follow them or not, or whether we trust these rules or not. And I thought of When Evil Lurks, how we have these rules of when these possessed beings will pop around, you know, never touch them or never look at them in the eye. I don't remember what the rules yeah, were. Yeah, there's something ethereal about it. But we didn't confirm all those rules were legit. Mm -hmm. They were just rules set for convenience. And it helps that an old witchy woman, I think, told us about them. Yeah, the grandma, right? Yeah. Yeah. So when you have that kind of woman telling you about it, Especially being Hispanic, it comes especially with a punch because you're like, oh, shit. Superstition. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm sold. You got yeah, me. Exactly. All right, Grandma. So it feels very fitting in that movie. It, it, I have no issues with it there. Here, I was a little bit like, eh, I don't know if that's your only reason or if you're trying to give the audience some rules on how people need to behave when they're being watched. Like, maybe a commentary on social media and when you film yourself, like, how you need to behave. Because there's just obviously things you should and shouldn't say when you're putting information of yourself out there in the world. You know, you don't want to get fired from your job, so you're not going to say the stupid things. But that was a little too far for me. Like you said earlier, it didn't have that impact we were looking for. It may be an important difference between, in the movie When Evil Lurks, we get a sense of the world. We get a sense of the state of things and people moving in and out of this situation that they're just living with. And the Watchers were inserting a character or a couple of characters into this box, sort of literally with a bound with the forest and with the literal coop, right? And so all of a sudden we're removed from any sense of ecology, right? 
the world yeah there's no world building to that yeah so there's a platform all of a sudden for a handful of stories right and one of those is very message driven and so it feels like there should have been more intent behind these things that are echoed throughout so yeah. i'm with you i feel like we're dealing with a little bit of bad storytelling because there's also this theme of isolation in the movie that I'm not quite sure where to place that. Again, with Mina grieving, she's also isolating herself from society. She's even wearing costumes and going out and being different people, being isolated in the woods. People are experiencing paranoia that I feel like it was brought up and maybe not dealt with again. Also with the guilt and maybe shame that Mina feels, it wasn't quite resolved enough to give us this picture-perfect family at the end where she reunites with her sister and her nephews. Yeah, because why do we care? Why do we care to see this? Why do we care that they're twins, I guess? That was funny, I thought. Yeah, that's on the mirror ring. Oh, sure, Shit. fair, yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. We didn't get any great dialogue out of her. We got that one flashback, different pieces of it throughout, with the car and her mom dying, obviously. Why do I care if she reunites back with her family? I want that bird to be delivered to where it needs to be more than anything, truthfully. Yep, yep. I'm with you. I was way too concerned about that bird. And you know what? I liked that the bird stayed with her. <laughs> like, all right, the bird's cool, and it's free to just fly around the house. That's cool. Did the doctor order the bird? No, it was going to a zoo. Oh, okay. I thought I thought the doctor ordered the bird to get somebody to come out there to for his fun little experiment. And then the bird is a great case study of a McMuffin where it's like, oh, shit, we got to follow the birds. So, like, I don't know if he meant that bird. I thought he meant all the crows and shit. Yeah, that was trying to establish that parallel, just like the watchers watching them and then watching that TV. Just kind of establishing these parallels of normalcy in this situation and storytelling. Because if they didn't have the crows, but they did have the parrot, I don't know what kind of bird it is, I'm just going to call it a parrot. <laughs> it mimicked. And she had the parrot, and they just followed the parrot. They'd be like, oh, that's that's bizarre. Why would you just pull that out? But... If they had just the crows and no parrot, it's like, oh shit, now, which way did the, the crows go, you know? <laughs> and so we got to kind of balance these two, and that's maybe a little obvious, but... And we've befriended the parrot. This is a trustworthy character. We all like him. He's like that Disney sidekick, like the Olaf and the Hey Hey from Moana. Yeah, she kept carrying him around. She didn't forget about him. She remembered him, you know? She named him. It's good stuff. Yeah, yeah. The bird was a good choice. If somehow we could have attached that bird to her inability to reconnect or just connect with her sister or the rest of her family, if if we could have just had some relationship symbolism, touchstone coming out of her and the bird for her family, her and her family... That could have been the start of something a little better in that route. Yeah, that would have worked. I don't know how you do that, but... Yeah, that I don't know. Worked. I don't know. It, this movie kind of makes me feel like Ishana read the book or was approached, maybe, and really only enjoyed the fairy route of how things went, but obviously still had to follow the source material to some degree. And the very last section of the book is her reuniting with her sister. And so it's just kind of shoehorned in because Mina's sort of irrelevant to the greater picture of this. Yeah. Like Darwin has more of a job. <laughs> I I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Ishana was obviously very passionate about this mythology supernatural stuff i can see the love that went into that she should have really just focused on that and was and committed to that idea 
because the supernatural elements and the horror elements were awesome for me. The Watchers, the fairies, I love that she introduced them and we never really saw them. We never really saw what they looked like and that that is awesome. As basic and horror 101 that is, a lot of people have trouble remembering that that's what the audience really wants to see. That That's the spook element. Because, oh my god, some of the parts that really got me were when you see these figures that all of a sudden start getting up. And like you said, they look kind of Slenderman-ish. And you're like, what the fuck is that? Like, I don't want, I don't want to watch that on the screen. And probably one of my favorite parts is when they have that camcorder out there and the fake husband wants to get in and we see his legs. I mean, these man's legs creep me out. Ishana needs to make a horror movie because she's got that. The man's legs creep me out. The creature walking by creep me out. That scene you mentioned earlier when they're in the shelter with the sticks and they all got up and held hands and whatnot. That freaked me out. That scene at the end when they killed Daniel and they were still all morphing and haven't completely morphed all the way. That was good. All the suspense and horror elements in the film were awesome. I totally agree. We just need to tune in on the writing and characterization of some of these guys, and we could have something really special with the Shauna. Now, I will say one thing I like in horror movies, especially like your schlocky ones, like your Insidious and things, Blumhouse, right? I like this little history lesson that comes along with the monster. And we get that here. And one of the coolest parts visually was when Mina went to the professor's office and saw how obsessive he was about this and the tapestry and it's cool. Yeah, and that's where her world building shined there. Maybe not even in the forest where most of this movie takes place, but with the fairies and their history. She was very much into that. And I think our main character, Mina was good for a horror movie. She was weird. She looked weird. She acted weird. She likes to mimic for some reason. Weird looking people that start mimicking are creepy as fuck. I liked it. But we needed to develop at least her dialogue more. Because as far as looks, she was a good character. As far as her behavior, she was a good character. And I even like that we made her this kind of rebel that doesn't listen. Because how often in horror movies are we like, nah, man, fuck the rules. Go do it. And she did it. We just needed better dialogue, a better story, and her interactions with the rest of the characters. How did you feel about the visuals in the movie? I know we saw this at the movie theater. and typically. Movies tend to look better at the movie theater and sound better at the movie theater. I know in some of the forest sections especially, it was a little bit too dark for me. And I know that was part of the suspense to not be able to see much, but it went a little too dark in my opinion. That I was almost squinting to see what was happening. Yeah, I thought the visuals were pretty cool. We're in Galway, Ireland. I don't know how you say that, probably in your Irish tongue, but that area is famous for its landscapes and where the land meets the water. I think the Deathly Hollow Harry Potter films were filmed there. It's just got amazing landscapes, amazing greenery, amazing old roads. I guess a lot of Europe has really cool roads and stuff from way back when. It just feels... Like, there's a lot of history. So, that obviously, you know, works on every level. Predatory by nature, because we don't have that here in the United States. The forest was cool. I don't think it was too dark. But I did like this kind of sense that time was manipulated somehow in the forest. But that didn't really seem to be true. 
because they had their 12, 16 hours to play out in the forest and get food, get food and whatever. Yeah. The Boros were kind of lame. I like the visual of them being capped off, like in the professor's study, but they just felt like holes in the ground. It would be kind of cool if they were like massive wells all bricked and stuff and like they felt like dungeons or something something medieval right or even like homes like they even mimicked how we live or how the professor lived yeah that would be cool to some degree like we see some kind of renovation even because it needs to be old but it could have been changed because of the coop the coop somehow changed mm. the way that they wanted to live the yeah. coop was cool with the big mirror of course right yeah how minimalistic it is in there and stuff. And and then when it's revealed that there's a whole fucking bunker underneath, which is kind of stupid, I guess. <laughs> but How do they not trip over that? I don't know. How do you spend so much time in a bunker like that? And not pull everything apart? Yeah, not yeah. just look at everything. I don't know how that works. But the thought on you know the professor bringing people out there to build that place and them dying every night and him having to get new folks and stuff is very cool a little impractical because it took so long for mina to get out there and they're in the middle of fucking nowhere i don't know how you bring supplies out there to continuously you know waste people like that without drawing some major national attention well they had all the like missing people on that poster board. There yeah, were a lot. But the feds would get involved in this. <laughs> all right. If a thousand people just went missing in an area, I guarantee you the national government's going to get involved in That's some funny. way. <laughs> You're going to wipe these fucking fairies out. You know what I'm saying? That's true. We would here in America. That's very true. And of course, the like I said, the study's very cool. The whole ending section, visually kind of lame. And the story didn't help. All right, man. Well, thank you for watching this movie with me. The first Ashana Knight Shyamalan film. Many more to come, maybe? I hope so. I hope so. This is very promising. Yeah, well, thank you for talking about it here today. You're welcome. Do you have a budget guess? My budget guess is $10 million. I know it's her debut, but she's got Daddy Shyamalan. He's a producer. The producer's the money, right? Yeah, it depends, but yeah. It is in this case. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely in this case. He's obviously very involved. Um, I didn't see a lot of interviews with him. I just saw a lot of interviews with her. But I did see an interview, and I mean, Daddy Shyamalan was very proud of his daughter. He just praised her and was so very proud that she put something out there, and she put herself out there, and made her idea come to life so i don't know how involved he actually was with the production of the film but it looks good so i'm not i'm not gonna lowball this and a lot of Shyamalan's films are very low budget except with with the exceptions of course of avatar and after earth i think those were a little bit higher so i'm i'm gonna give this 10 it says here that it was $30 million. $30 million? Daddy Shyamalan put money out. <laughs> and it went on to make so far $30.5 million. It's not making any more money at the box office, though. It's moved to video on demand. So okay. It'll probably end up being all right. Yeah, I'm kind of wondering if they're trying to separate the two. And, and M. Night's trying to avoid the concern of him holding her hand, Ashana. Because his name is such a force in Hollywood, whether you like him or not, he is a household name that people are just going to immediately be like, you know, so how involved was M. Night here? Yeah. It's like, okay. And I get that. That's whatever. But if I had a dad that was a household name and I wanted to do something that he has obviously excelled at, I would want his help. I wouldn't want him to hold my hand, but I would definitely love and appreciate every feedback he gave. Yes, you need to use your privileges in the world. Yes. It's a privilege to be M. Knight's daughter on some level. I get the impression he is fucking loving to the nth plus one degree. From what I've seen of him, he seems like a very passionate, loving person. Yeah, in the interview, oh my god, he was so proud of her. He just kept like 
saying how proud he was. Yeah, and the way people have talked about M. Night is just, it's awesome. And the interviewer asked them, because they were both there. He was the main one talking because they were really interviewing him and she was just there. But the interviewer asked them what horror movie they liked watching or what types of horror movies they like watching. I don't really remember what they said, but he was very taken aback by the question and made it very clear that he had his own horror he likes and she had her own horror she liked. Nice. We're two different people. We're very much different. You know, he wasn't insulted by the question, but of course. He, he took that chance to say, hey, we're not just here to both make the same kind of movie. She has her own thought and her own idea. And he was so proud that she was part of this feministic movement for women to put film out in the world. I mean, he was over the moon. If I could meet one celebrity and get their autograph, it'd be M. Night. Yeah, get it for me. <laughs> get one get one for me too. Well, over on Letterboxd with seventy three thousand people, they weighed in at a two point five. What? That's a little low. That's a little low. Especially because movies tend to get a little inflated. Yeah, when they have any kind of charm, they seem to be a little inflated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> And I thought this had the right kind of charm. I'm giving it a three. It's very, very solid. I can't wait to see more when she finds her footing, her flair. Yeah, I'm probably giving this a, a two. All right, man. Well, thank you again for talking about this movie. And thank you guys for listening to this episode of The Film of Steins. Tune in next time for A Quiet Place Day One, directed by the lovely Michael Sarnowski. Wait, it's not John Krasinski? No, I think he co-wrote it with Michael. And John's doing the third installment, part three or whatever, next year. Oh, okay, okay. Hmm. Michael, of course, did the wonderful movie Pig with Nick Cage. Okay. One of the greatest movies ever made. So there is that. I will just say I don't know how you tell the day one story when we got it in part two. That's all I'm going to say. Kind of. We get it in some flashbacks and stuff, but it's the better part of that movie. So we will see. We also get it very specific with the family. So. Okay. I think this one takes place in New York. So, But thank you, everyone, again. We post every Monday and Friday on free feeds and every other Wednesday on patreon.com slash filmsteins for big Patreon episodes. You can also find us on Spotify, Pandora, YouTube. Apple Podcasts. Go rate us on Apple Podcasts, please. Remember to leave nice comments, thoughts, and ideas on our Patreon as well. Come request a movie. Come write in. Come subscribe for a dollar. We appreciate all the support. Thank you guys very much. But until next time, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that's a wrap for today's episode of The Filmsteins. Thanks for tuning in and joining us on our cinematic journey. We hope you enjoyed the discussion and gain some new insights and perspectives in the world of movies. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and your favorite platform, especially Patreon at patreon.com slash filmsteins, and follow us on social media for more film-related content. We love hearing from our listeners, so if you have any feedback, suggestions, movie recommendations, or book recommendations, please feel free to reach out to us. Until next time, keep watching and keep loving the magic of movies. This is The Filmsteins signing off.